Greetings. I'm Rob Redden, and I'm glad to be able to bring you another lesson from God's Holy Word. Lately, I've been sharing lessons with you uh, concerning our Christian character, developing Christian growth, and spiritual maturity. This lesson is going to be a little on the negative side because I think that we have to deal with both the negative and the positive. And so today we're going to talk about deception. In particular, being deceived. You know, ma magicians are so fascinating to me. We've gone to shows to watch some of the most amazing things that appear to be almost miraculous. They are masters of deception. They're called illusionists for a reason. The most recognized among the greats is Harry Houdini, the renowned escape artist. But the man who made the most wealth is David Copperfield. He made the Statue of Liberty disappear, so to speak, and even floated across the Grand Canyon. There's a lot of great ma uh, magicians, Jonathan Todd, the Magic Dragon, Michael Carbonaro, Doug Henning, Juan Tamaras, Darren Brown, David Blaine, Penn and Teller, and many others. What they all have in common is that they are above board about their performances. They don't claim to perform miracles. They have this one, one thing in common, and that is deception. They create illusions so that you see what you expect to see. But they let you know that they are magicians or illusionists. They don't expect you to think they are miracle workers. Their fame is to entertain you with acknowledged deceptions. You know, unfortunately, there are millions of deceivers in the world that don't tell you up front that they are deceiving you. You probably get emails every day, like I do, from deceivers who wish to deceive us into believing that if you don't answer their email right away, you'll be fined or your credit card will be frozen. Scams are a constant danger like never before. But there are religious shysters who take uh, the money from those deceived and feather their nest with money promising to go to a good cause. Of course, the outstanding ones that come to mind is Jim Baker and Tammy Faye, renowned for their deception of religious folks, becoming one of the worst fraudsters in our country, especially Jim Baker. The late Jerry Falwell called Jim Baker the greatest scab and cancer on the face of Christianity in 2,000 years of church history. Today, one of the richest televangelists in the world is Joel Olstein. He also preaches for one of the largest churches in America, if not the largest. He is one of the most eloquent orators and communicators in the religious field. That makes it even more dangerous. I saw him not long ago on the Larry King live show. Well, it was a few years ago. And Larry asked him whether or not he preached against homosexuality according to the Bible. His response is, that wasn't his calling. He had been called to preach the love of Jesus. You know, Jesus spoke out against sin specific sins, and he talked a lot about hell. But today, hell is not in man's vocabulary unless he's using it to curse. I point out these things because Paul did too, and he called the false teachers and deceivers by name. Finally, told the, uh, finally Paul told the Corinthians, who were infiltrated by false teachers who sought to discredit Paul, in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 13, For such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as angels, uh, pardon me, as apostles of Christ. 
And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, their end will correspond to their deeds. 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15. So we must beware of those who may deceive us regarding morals and biblical doctrine. Now, there are those who do this unintentionally. A cult leader may be so obsessed with his delusion that he believes he was sent by God. He also believes that his methods and motives are pure and divine. This type of deceiver has deceived himself. Paul speaks of this in 2 Timothy 3.13. Evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. There are, there are those deceivers who know what they're doing and intentionally seek to manipulate the morals of a society. Hugh Hefner sought to manipulate the morals of a society, and he succeeded in just a few short years. The time was ripe with the Vietnam War and the drug revolution, the hippies, a subculture generation. They're now grandparents, and they continue flaunting their free love and rejection of authority in any form. If the series on TV reflect the general moral values of the majority of the people in America, we are in serious moral decline. Many of the people today have a live, let live philosophy. And the expression is not bad, but what they mean by that is leave people alone who are living in immorality. It's their choice. Accept it. What they will tell you if you stand up for right and wrong, that you're judging, even if you stand up for the biblical values that condemn certain actions. We are told to be on watch for deceivers. First John 4, 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. Even 2,700 plus years ago, the same thing was going on among the Jewish people who had the Old Testament to guide them. But Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 5 and verse 20, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. It's still going on today. If we do not listen to God's word and to the wisdom of spiritual leaders, we will listen to the godless that will remove the danger sign that says dead end. We will self-destruct spiritually, morally, and doctrinally. I would like to ask those so-called Christians who accept homosexuality, what is immoral? How can one accept the Bible and not oppose sexual immorality? I will tell you how. They come up with a new way to interpret the Bible. They reject what they don't want by stating that those laws were culturally conditioned and are not applicable in our different culture. What was wrong then is not what was wrong then was not committed relationships, but rape and incest and temple prostitution, where young boys and young men and young women prostituted themselves in the name of their gods. They just don't read the same New Testament that I do, or the Old Testaments. Can you imagine back there in Corinth? wives felt what they felt when their husbands told them, honey, I'm going down to the temple to worship, to visit a temple prostitute. Immorality is still immorality. You can change the name, but you can't change what it really is. Furthermore, doctrinally, there's deception as well. For those who want to deceive us into believing that the Bible is only 
a help for us to just simply love one another. There isn't a Christian in the world who's a real Christian who would deny that we are to discover how to love our fellow man from the Bible. But this doesn't address the major issue, and that is the sin issue. When we read the Bible, we discover a God that is holy and righteous. There must be a distinction between right and wrong. And everyone will agree that some things are wrong. There is a right and wrong. Unless someone is a psychopath, everyone agrees that it's wrong to torture children. C.S. Lewis gives this as an example, that we all can agree that there are things that are sinful. But what are they? You're going to trust godless men to tell you what's right or wrong? You know, we can make a long list of the things most people would agree is sinful, but there is a long list of things people don't agree on because they're walking in worldly wisdom rather than the wisdom and the teachings of God. But a holy God can't be holy without also being just. Wrongdoing must be punished. The story of Adam and Eve serves as a microcosm of human experience. Sooner or later, we fall to the temptation and sin. Romans 3 teaches us that God's love moved him to find a way to forgive sins and remove the eternal penalty for us and yet remain just. Picture for a moment a judge's son comes before him and he's convicted of a horrible crime. The judge cannot show favoritism without becoming an unjust judge. What if he told his son that he would do the time for him? Would anyone say he's unjust? What if God's son says, I will take the punishment for our brothers and sisters? If God allows it, no one would accuse him of being unjust. His sacrifice of his son is a demonstration of his love, his holiness, and his justice. And that's exactly what God and Jesus did. During World War II, a Catholic priest by the name of Father Kobe was in a concentration camp. The commanding officer told the prisoners that if anyone escaped, seven prisoners would be put to death. Well, the day finally came. A prisoner escaped. The commander lined up all the prisoners and picked out seven prisoners. One cried and cried, pleading, say, said that he had four children and a wife and they needed him. The priest, seeing this, asked a guard if he could speak to the commander. He was allowed, and he begged the commander to let him take the man's place. He said that he had no wife or children, and he would gladly die in that man's place. The commander permitted it, and according to witnesses, Priest Kobe was put in a damp cellar and went without food and water for days on end. Finally, he was injected with a lethal injection, and he died. Shortly afterwards, the Allies freed the remaining prisoners. And after the war, the man Kobe saved built a monument in his backyard. And every year, the date of Kobe's death, he would visit the concentration camp in honor of the man who gave his life for him. This is a story of redemption, and it is the heart of the gospel. Jesus died for us, and this made it possible for God to remain just and holy when he forgives us of our sins, for the penalty fell upon Jesus. Who would now accuse God of being unjust or unholy in forgiving sins for Jesus took our place? But you know, this goes deeper. There's a deeper question. Doesn't the one who sacrificed his life deserve honor? It did in Kobe's place. In his case, I wish I could pronounce the Polish man's name, but I can't. To his dying day, he was grateful and honored his Savior, not from sin, but from mortal death. We honor our Lord by serving him according to his word. We must recognize that his example will stand forever, and we must follow the path that he has placed before us. You know, there are many who will deceive us into thinking that the Bible is not relevant today, that it's old-fashioned and out of date. But let's remind them that billions of people disagree. 
The Bible remains the best-selling book of all time, and today, according to the United Bible Society and the Wycliffe Bible Translator Society, all or portions of the Bible have been translated into more than 3,000 languages. I'm shocked that there are that many languages, but I'm greatly impressed how valuable and desirable the Word of God is throughout the world. So don't let the myopic vision of these people who discredit the Bible because they don't see its relevancy, because they are deceived. So don't let misinformation deceive you. The Bible is accepted as the Word of God by billions and billions of people around the world. Since time is the essence, there's another facet to this subject. Of course, we need to be careful of those who deceive us. But we better make sure that we don't deceive ourselves. That expression, deceive himself, is found several times. In Galatians 6, 3, if anyone thinks he's something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. James 1, 26, if anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, the man's religion is worthless. So we can deceive ourselves in thinking that our religion is sound. We can deceive ourselves in thinking that we are somebody really important to God even. But we can deceive ourselves. You know, your mind can play tricks on you. It does on me all the time. This is common. You know the old worn-out line, a man was holding an ice pack on his head? His friend asked him what happened. He said, I thought she said stand up, but she said shut up. <laughs> well, it's more serious than that. Ego defenses or defense mechanisms are an everyday experience. We all want to be right. We want to avoid criticism. We want to be thought as intelligent and wise. We want to make the best decisions. We want to be above criticism. We are ego-driven due to our fallen nature. And scholars have identified over 30 ego defenses. What that means is that we will almost do anything to uphold our self-esteem and our ego. And I'm not going to bore you with all of them, but let's at least look at the obvious, obvious ones. And the classic one, of course, is scapegoating. Adam and Eve began this ego defense to lessen their culpability and responsibility. Adam said, well, your wife, my wife, pardon me, the woman you gave me, gave to me and I ate. In other words, Lord, it's her fault. And quite frankly, had you not given me her, I would not have done it. In essence, he's blaming God. Eve, of course, blame Satan. Now, obviously, they ought to all had a part in it. But the fact of the matter is, when we play the blame game, scapegoating, we are using an ego defense to try to feel good and reduce culpability and responsibility. This is seen in how often the culprit turns things around to become the victim. Why does everything that tastes good is fattening or isn't good for me? Rationalization, right? If we can twist the circumstances around to explain the behavior, it is easy to feel innocent, at least not responsible for our behavior. You know, there are certain categories of rationalization that we rationalize, we think through a situation in order to defend ourselves, excuse ourselves, or to blame circumstances or other things. One is, well, I could have done worse. In other words, choosing the lesser of two evils. Lord, I could have done worse. 
As a matter of fact, I am not as bad as other people. There are so many people worse than me. The thing is, God doesn't allow us to choose the lesser of two evils. We cannot choose either. Certainly, if one is going to sin, the sin with the lesser consequence is done by anyone with a conscience, but that doesn't give a person a pass. And if they think so, they've chosen an ego defense to soothe their consciences. Ego defenses are not consciously done, but may be seen after the fact. One does not say, I'm scapegoating when I've chosen to kick a dog because my boss chewed me out. But I came to my senses later and reflected upon my behavior and realized that I displaced my anger on the dog. You know, this happens, unfortunately, on others such as mates and children. Road rage can also be displaced anger. The assumption is that there are fewer consequences, but that isn't always so. A person could get killed because of road rage, and a wife could leave her husband, and children may distance themselves from the unpredictable rage of a parent. Then there's another rationalization called sour grapes, and the other side of it is sweet lemons. Aesop's fable of the little fox. He's walking along in an orchard and he sees a vine of grapes that's hanging down from a branch. And he looked at it and he said, oh, those really look good. So he takes a leap, but he's too weak. He can't reach the grapes. And he jumps again and again. After the fourth time, he says, as he walks away, those grapes are sour anyway. Well, the other side of it, he could have used the sweet lemons approach and saying, well, I'm sure there are better grapes down the road. We can do that too. We can simply say, God just is too restricting. God demands too much, and it's impossible. And therefore, excuse oneself of not trying hard enough. Or they may change to a religion that offers them an easy way, and so they use the sweet lemon approach. Let me also talk to you a little bit about cognitive dissonance. That's a mouthful. Basically, it's our mental confusion. Cognitive dissonance means there's a conflict between beliefs and practices. You know, if I have a strong belief that something is wrong and I continue doing that, I suffer guilt. And I have to deal with that. I can do one of two things to bring peace to my mind. I can change the practice and uphold my beliefs and live in harmony, or I can change my beliefs and continue doing what I want to do that's wrong and result in the same harmony and peace. It's that easy to defend ourselves, rationalizing and changing our beliefs so that we can continue our sinful behavior or we change our practices in harmony with our beliefs. That's something that we have to keep an eye on. Have we changed our views on a certain teaching because it's come close to home? It's easy to take convictions very strongly if that issue does not affect you personally. But once it enters into your life and your family, it's amazing how easy it is to change your beliefs to justify the practices of your family and loved ones. Furthermore, stereotyping is also a common ego defense, a self-deception. When we heard people say, and we have said it probably ourselves, all blank, you fill in the blank, 
All blank are lazy. All blank are oversexed. All homeless are irresponsible. All blondes are dumb. All dancers are gay. You've heard these things and a thousand others. And such stereotyping isn't new. We find in John 1, 45 through 46, Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Later, when the leaders sought to arrest Jesus, the officers failed and came back. And it says in John chapter 7, 44 through 52, it says, <clears throat> Some of them wanted to seize him, but no one laid hands on him. The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said to him, them, Why did you not bring him? And the officers answered, Never has a man spoken the way this man speaks. The Pharisees then answered him, You have not also been led astray, have you? Speaking of Jesus, of course. No one of the rulers of the, or the Pharisees has believed in him, has he? But this crowd, which does not know the law, is accursed. Nicodemus, he who came to him before, being one of them, said to them, Our law does not judge a man unless it first hears from him and knows what he's doing and does it. They answered him, You are not also from Galilee, are you? Search and see that no prophet arises out of Galilee. As we all know, stereotyping supports one's sense of superiority, and that's always good for our ego, right? But we also know it is based upon ignorance. Nathaniel learned later that Jesus from Nazareth was the one that was prophesied by Moses. Also, those chief priests and Pharisees were incorrect in assuming that no prophet arises out of Galilee. The prophet Jonah came from Galilee. His home was gath Hever, 2 Kings 14.25, which was only three miles north of Nazareth, which is in Galilee. Stereotyping makes us feel superior, and it also excuses us from being concerned with certain people. Today, we see law enforcement officers being stereotyped as vicious egomaniacs who abuse their authority. We see people condemning those illegals who come into the country as criminals and losers. Sure, some are criminals. And I don't approve breaking the law to get here, but I also believe that most of us would do what we could to escape oppression and poverty. If I was raised living in cardboard homes that I've seen in Mexico, making my way into the U.S. to improve living conditions might be worth the effort. This is not a suggestion that I support changing the laws, but there's got to be a better way to handle this serious condition than to vilify all the people that are trying to find a better life and escape the horrible conditions where they live. My point is not about solving the problem, but the problem of looking down on others to make ourselves appear superior is the issue. God wants us to stop deceiving ourselves. There's another serious ego defense, and it's generalization. It's very close to stereotyping. This comes from basing our judgment on a small sample of examples. If you have only been around a small number of a certain race and they were rude, it is easy to decide that all people of that race are rude. And this is also true of judging a person by their lack of education, by their job, by their class in society, whether they're rich or, for, or they're poor. If you have known a few doctors who were arrogant, do you conclude that all doctors are arrogant? When you've been around a shy, introvert person and jumped to the conclusion that that person was aloof and unfriendly, this pandemic has led to a lot of 
generalization, positions based upon anecdotal evidence, evidence in the form of stories that tell people that people tell about what has happened to them. If you gather a number of similar stories and draw a conclusion based upon these stories, you have not made a scientific judgment. If a scientist takes a position that the vaccines don't improve one's chances of surviving COVID and picks and chooses the evidence to support his position, he is not being scientific. He's a conspiracy theorist. If one has to distrust, if one has to dis, um, distrust, if one distrusts the government, he may believe in some conspiracy and see only what he wants to see. You can support any theory. There are those who are flat earthers. They can twist the evidence to support their theory. In 2017, national poll by public policy polling found that 1% of Americans believed the earth was flat and another 6% saying they weren't sure. People can deceive themselves. And the longer you're deceived about something, it can lead to character flaws. You know, this is also seen in drawing conclusions from Scripture. Someone would say, the Bible says all you have to do is believe and be saved. And they don't change their manner of life. John 3.16 they believe it, and they believe they're saved. It says, whoever believes shall be saved, I believe, but they don't change their life. The word for that is repent. Now, picking out verses to support your preconceived idea of what you want, is that sound reasoning? It's self-deception, and we got to be aware of it. There are those that say, I'm saved by faith, so I don't have to be baptized. Well, obviously, that person is not dealing honestly with the verses about baptism. Those verses demand that a believer be baptized. And if a person rejects that commandment to be baptized, then he does not have a saving faith. Basically, a mental ascent, a nod of the head. Yeah, Jesus died, and he died for the sins of the world, but it never made a difference. No one would argue about being baptized if he truly believed. And so he just will not pick and choose as he would at a salad bar. You know, in Galatians chapter 6, 7 through 8, Paul says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked, for whatever a man sows, this he will also reap, for if the for the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. You know, we must be vigilant about the possibility that we are being deceived. You know, we ought to also understand that Satan is still alive and well, and he's constantly deceiving us. We've already noticed how he can fashion himself as an angel of light. And what that means is that he can influence us through individuals who are actually servants of Satan. It's like a wolf in sheep's clothing, as Jesus says. He disguises himself to deceive his victims. In Ephesians 6 and verse 11, we are told to put on the armor of God so that you will be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. In verse 16, he says, With all these, take the shield of faith, with which you are able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. You know, if Satan shoots arrows, he's got a target. And let me tell you, every Christian has a target on his back for Satan. And we've got to have the shield of faith strong enough to quench those flaming arrows. In 1 Peter 5, 8, discipline yourselves, keep alert like a roaring lion, your adversary, the devil, prowls around looking for someone to devour. You know, a lion can search out its prey very, very effectively. And he knows when he finds 
the stray or the one that is weak, not keeping up with a herd, and single out and capture his prey. We must be strong and we must discipline ourselves and keep alert so that we will not be deceived and be vulnerable to the wiles of the devil. Now, there's so much I could say, but this lesson, I think, helps us to recognize how easy it is to be deceived and how easy it is to deceive ourselves. We must be serious students of God's word. And that's what it means to be a disciple. But it means more than just reading. It means be putting it into action. Now, James 1.22 says, Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Put the word into action. Let's pray. Father God, the great deceiver wants to pull us away from you and from your word. May we understand what deceives us and how we deceive ourselves that lead us astray. May we love you and your word and seek to learn from you and yield our lives to your spirit. Help us to pursue holiness and reverential fear of you, our God. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, I want to thank you for your precious time to listen to this message. And if I have helped one person to be more vigilant and more insightful into the things that deceive us and how we deceive ourselves, my efforts have been worthwhile. May God bless you and keep you until we meet again. God bless you and God keep you. Goodbye.